Estrela alva brilha em mim. Please stand by. Brilha we'll be streaming live soon. Que é no mundo meu viver. Please stand by. We'll be streaming live soon. Good morning. And I'm here back into this resting time where I have my, uh, my, little, my little place to sleep right there. And by the way, uh, resting and being able to prepare for these messages has been a wonderful experience for me. And uh, today I'm, go I'm going to share with you the concept of prophetic in the Old Testament and the prophetic in the New Testament. So we have to know how, how, how this works. For instance, Jesus, every word that Jesus spoke is prophetic. And if you study theology, if you read books on prophets, you know, the, we get this understanding here. And the understanding is this. Prophets foretold events to happen. Foretold events that would happen. So the New Testament... Is not foretold, it's foretelling, which means establishing the need and praying that it comes true and speaking to it. It's a positive attitude toward life, a positive attitude toward people and who they are. And so it's a mode of life, a mode of rhetoric, a mode of speak of speech that 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 emphasizes prophesying. Now, Acts 3, uh, 18 has an interesting scripture. It says, but those things which God before has showed us by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. So Christ fulfilled 300 prophecies. 300 prophecies in the Bible. And so, now, in order to apply this to you and I, we have to sort of begin with a question. When someone, how to identify the prophetic in your life? Are you the type of person who has the ability to speak into people's lives? Or, or are you, 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 you don't have that call, that anointing. You see, there's a lot of people, and, and uh, some of them do well encouragement. Some of them do well uh, uh, Pray for them. Some, some do well in visitation. Some do well in, in providing a party and, and establishing a, a cell in your church uh, with, uh, with people. Some are prophetically endowed with the ability to speak in people's lives spiritually. And so what I'm saying to you is that I don't know who you are, but you've got to know who you are. You've got to look at yourself and see if you have that gift to speak into people's lives. Because the idea of going to church, sitting on the pew and going back home and giving some money, it's not going to get you anywhere. If your vocal expression of your faith damages people and your family, you need healing. You shouldn't be in this area. You should just get a vacation and get a doctor. Something is not right when the verbal is so negative. Now, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, it's an interesting scripture because it works in this area, meaning that Peter, Matthew, Mark, John, the apostles, all of them had a degree of high, intense, prophetic utterances. They were with Jesus. And so what Jesus had, the prophetic in Jesus, the idea of speaking the kingdom into the earth, rub off in all these disciples. And they were just loaded with it. I mean, that, that, that's where the power is. But Second Peter 1.20, Peter says this, No prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Prophet own interpretation. In other words, what's been spoken is implemented in your life because it, it is in a, in a uh, movement from... E, from, from the Garden of Eden all the way here 
uh, after the cross and, the, and now the second coming of Christ. In other words, it, it, is, it, is, it is revolutionary. It, it is powerful. It's moving forward. It's not of you. It's from God. So, let me explain a little more. Prophecy never had its own origin in the human will. But prophets, through faith, spoke for God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves the prophet as the wind propels the ship. The Holy Spirit moves the prophet as the wind propels the ship. And so, the prophetic word can come in all kinds of ways, all kinds of manners. But I want you to, to sort of hear one more time. I want to say it again. Prophecy never had its origin in the human will. It doesn't come from my will and what I think, what I rationalize. It comes from God. The Holy Spirit moves the prophet, the one that's speaking, as a wind propels the ship. In other words, there's a rudder in that ship. And the Holy Spirit's got hold of the rudder and leads to where it wants to go instead of you uh, being in charge of the direction. Now, there are many ways that uh, the prophetic and the scriptures uh, speaks to us. For instance, one of, the, one of the most powerful one is in writing. Paul's letter, 14 epistles of the New Testament, Regardless if you love Paul, if you hate Paul, if you don't agree with Paul, the Apostle Paul, those 14 letters, especially the book of Romans, is something to behold. It's something to behold. The disciples didn't have that utterance, but Paul did. So here's an interesting uh, idea on the writing. He gave unto Moses, God gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communication of him upon Mount Sinai, two letters of testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. The communication from God about the Ten Commandments in Mount Sinai came in writing on tablets of stone, kept by the disciples in the Ark of the Covenant, in the Holy of Holies, and all of the sanctuaries built, all, even the Tabernacle of Solomon. Sometimes it's oral. It's not written, but it's oral. God speaks, you hear a voice. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And so the conversation in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5 to 10, began with an angel in the bush as the burning bush burns. Talking to Moses, a human being. Notice that that changed the life of Moses. But it was verbally done. A vision also carries a prophetic power. Peter in, in a trance in the house of, of, of uh, uh, in, in, in before he came into chapter 9 in the resurrection of Dorcas, Paul Peter is in the house of, of this man that uh, dealt with uh, 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 Simon the tenor. He, he was a tenor. He, he, he colored uh, skins of animals. Peter was there in a trance, heaven open. And see a sheet coming down from heaven filled with four foot beasts four-footed beasts of the earth. And a voice from heaven said to, to Peter, Peter, kill and eat what God has cleansed. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. It was a, it was a, a vision. He was about to have lunch. And Joppa, men from Joppa, from the house of Dorcas, came to get the apostle Peter. And it was 12 o'clock and he is waiting for lunch. And he had this vision of a sheet coming from heaven with four-footed animals. And, uh, and, uh, and, and Paul said, Peter said, I, 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 I don't want to eat this. I, I can't eat this for lunch. And the Lord says, kill and eat what I made clean. Do not call unclean. 
And so, and so I'm sort of a, a, trying to explain to you that it could be through a vision. So the prophetic moves through a vision. I had that happen in my life so many times, especially when I had to make major decisions. And, uh, and uh, uh, as, you, as you remember, uh, that early in my ministry, I was working on the state of Rio de Janeiro where our mission is, and uh, I had to find a way uh, to know and ask God where I was supposed to go. I had no direction. I was traveling to Brasilia, traveling to, to Belo Horizonte, traveling to the state of Sao Paulo, Campinas, many, many. I remember one city is called Formiga, which is Ant. I remember all of that. It was, a, it was an interesting time in my life that I traveled with a bus. I bought a bus and I just went from city to city. But when it came time to know direction, I had no idea. And I had a vision of the Lord saying to me, uh, stay in Rio for 15 years. And I did. I stayed in Rio with Bishop Paul Lachman preaching in all the churches there. And so a vision can change your life. The prophetic and the vision is a reality. Now, so that's Old Testament. What is the applicability of prophetic power in the New Testament? Because what I'm talking to you is about the Old Testament. Now, does the prophetic change in, 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 the, new, in the Old Testament to the New Testament? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So let me identify then first before we move into the New Testament. Because in the New Testament... Uh, when all is fulfilled through Christ, it is finished, Jesus said on the cross. From that moment on, we move into grace, into the church age, into the application and the applicability of serving God through the gifts and through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you don't understand this area, you're, you're, you're like a man that lost both arms. You're not able to apply, you're not able to impose, you're not able to correct, you're not able to uh, build and to multiply because you, 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 you are a football player without arms. You can't receive the ball, you can't catch the ball. So what is then the gift of prophecy in the New Testament? It's a gift that separates, listen to this, it's a gift that separates the common person from the actual prophet. In other words, when Paul began to deal with this in, in, uh, in, uh, in 1 Timothy, uh, uh, or 2 Timothy, somewhere there, uh, he dealt Ephesians 4, that's right, Ephesians 4. He dealt with offices of ministry. For instance, some people are preachers, some are teachers, teachers, some are preachers, some are evangelists, some are prophets, and some are uh, pro apostles. Now, those five are people's calling and, uh, and, 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 and uh, people that serve the Lord and all, 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 all kinds of things. Uh, is there a prophet place in the New Testament? Yes, there is. But the common person is separated from the actual prophet because prophesying is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, let me say to you, it's one of the most ignored, one of the most belittled, one of the most harassed gifts of the Holy Spirit in the life of the, of the, of the church age. Because it's, it, 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 it minimizes the vocal power of your faith. What web, what what the Holy Spirit does with prophesying in your speaking, in your vocal ability, in your, in your ability to lift and encourage and build people, is that it weaponizes this gift. Prophesying weaponizes the rhetoric and moves into the prophetic. You can be rhetorically very powerful, but there's no power on your Jude, no power in your word, no power in your preaching, no power as to who you are. It's almost 
it's almost that it does, you know, when you speak, people's hearts are not changed, are not renewed, are not empowered. They're, they're not really doing nothing. The power of the Holy Spirit in your life is so suppressed by your faith that never grows, never prospers. And so, prophecy here coming out of 1 Corinthians 12. When Paul talks about Prophecy turns into interpretation. This prophecy in the first, first Corinthians chapter 12, 1 through 10, has to do with prophesying, nothing to do with the prophet. I've been saying this a lot. So, how do you identify? It? Operates as a gift. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, some of you have it, some of you don't. Some of you do know about it, but resist and some of you respect it and receive it. And what I'm saying to you today is that if your power of rhetoric is greater than the power of prophesying, you call people to yourself. You call people to yourself, they see you. They are, they, they, they are growing on you, on your faith. They begin to like you instead of respecting you. They begin to laugh with you and rejoice with you. Instead of being empowered, renewed, set free, most churches that have a pastor that calls attention to himself constantly, when he leaves, everybody leaves with him. So number one, things begin to fall around here in the office. <laughs> in other words, that's, that's the power of the Holy Spirit shaking, the, shaking this building right now in the name of Jesus. Operates as a gift. You know, we had with us a, tea, a Bible teacher uh, about two, three years ago called Betty McKinney. And people sort of uh, was overwhelmed by her teaching. She just set the world on fire with her teaching. People were motivated by, empowered by, renewed by. I mean, she was the best teacher we've had in many, many years. Now, let me say this. She had the power of the prophetic in her mouth. The prophetic in her mouth. It began to minister to hundreds and hundreds of people. Thousands, literally, still today, through this channel, latterrain.com, are being empowered by that teaching. You can follow Betty McKinney on our website, and we continue to play her material here. So, number two, operates as a gift, number one. Number two, for the common good. And so the prophetic power of utterance, instead of the rhetoric power, it's for the common good. It's not something just for you. As a matter of fact, is is weaponizing the prophetic in your life above your intellect, your rationale, your concepts, your personality, who you are, your education, your degrees are totally coming to a, a lower part of your power, power set base, and in it moves into the Holy Spirit's realm. Now, if you want to have a definition of that, go to 1 Corinthians 14.3. Go to 1 Corinthians 14.3. It says, prophesying is to edify, to build, and to comfort. Prophesy is to edify, to build, and to comfort. Now, we've got to have an example of someone who did that. Because in the Bible there are many people that had this powerful gift. But this man stands alone in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 4 verse 32, his name was changed from Joseph to Barnabas. The disciples called him the son of consolation. He had a personality to comfort, to encourage. He was so respected by them and so loved by the disciples that they put their trust in him. When Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem to meet with the disciples, introduce Paul 
when, when Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem to, to meet the disciples, Barnabas took Paul, went to the disciples and said, this is not a killer anymore. He is not uh, a man that kills Christians anymore. He is a man of God now. He had a, con- in a confrontation with God in the road of Damascus, straight street, and now he's a powerful man and y'all don't have to be afraid of him. And he opened the door for Peter and James to meet with Paul for two weeks in Jerusalem. What a wonderful meeting that was. I, I want to be a fly on the wall just to hear what Paul is sharing with Peter and James in Jerusalem. All the other disciples took off. <laughs> but Barnabas sat and partook of that meeting. When Peter, from, when Paul was in in, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, north of, uh, of Jerusalem, uh, where they first were called Christians. What is the name of that city? Uh, as, they, as they were together there, Antioch, they, Antioch. Antioch, Paul was there a year before God gave him direction. So for a whole year, Paul stayed in Antioch ministering, sharing, empowering. Where do you think Paul got that anointing? Where do you think Paul got that unction? Where do you think it came from? Prophesying. When Paul opened his mouth, God began to speak to people's hearts. He he founded seven churches of Revelation. He discipled Timothy. But even before the missionary journeys started, After a year of Paul being back from Saudi Arabia in his 14 years of of waiting on the Lord, suddenly he is in Antioch, ministry for a whole year. And when he met some of the prophets that came in from Africa, five of them were there. If you go into into your Bible in Acts chapter 13, you're going to find them. These five men of God were praying and fasting. And one of them said, Separate from me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work which I have already called them. And suddenly Barnabas and Paul began the first missionary journey. Do you understand? In other words, the power of the prophetic in your life will change your ability to communicate with people The power of the Holy Spirit transforms your rhetoric into an anointing that grows and prospers within you and the life of others. I just want to know if you're hearing me. I want to know if you're hearing me. I'm speaking to you this morning and want to know if you're hearing me. Which power dominates your life, the prophetic of God or the rhetoric of yourself? How do you operate as a pastor, as a minister, as a bishop? It's kind of interesting that leaders of the church are so scared of the Holy Spirit as if somehow they're going to be be, be contagious with prophetic utterances. And that's what happens. When a spiritual leader moves himself in the area of the prophetic, the whole church grows. The power of the Holy Spirit is to one or to a hundred or to a thousand. It's, it, it's a movement prophetic that speaks wide open into your environment, into your nation, into where you live. You can be in Africa and you can impact your whole, whole area by the power of the Holy Spirit speaking into it. How many times I have stand in front of a, of a bar that is selling liquor to minors, lift my hand and yell and scream for 30 minutes, and the bar was closed a month later. How many times I've done that? You probably say, Rick, but this is the work of the evangelist, and you're a little awed. I won't be able to do that. When you see a boy, 13 years old, drunk, sleeping under, my, under, under newspapers in the area where we minister in Brazil, You get mad enough to speak and to say in the name of Jesus, I call this place to close. Now, 
I want to have a prayer with you in these next five minutes and 25 seconds. Because I know that some of you are not really uh, uh, able to understand what I'm saying. And I want to communicate with you in, in any way I possibly can. The reason why the problems of psychological problems, mental problems exist in your family is because you speak hate and anger and bitterness and resentment instead of kindness and gentleness and tenderness. When you begin prophetically doing that, it changes your whole family. Why is it that young people are committing suicide in America at a, at a so high rate of, uh, of events? Why are they killing themselves? It's because there's nothing that comes out of the mouth of the father or the mother that a boy needs to hear. So why, why to live? I live in hell in my family. My father and my mother never speak comforting words to me or encouraging words to me. Well, I'm challenging you today to respond to what I'm saying because it might have to do with your children, your grandchildren, and who they are. The imposition of your verbal and to them is so negative that they, wanna, they don't want to be with you. They run from you. I thank God that my family loves me. I have a son called Rick Bonfim. He lives in Macon, Georgia, married to Laura Bonfim. They have two children, Harrison and Mary Jane. And I love them, and they respond to my love, and I appreciate them. I have, I have a, a son called Sammy, married to Cindy. And I have three girls from that family, Lucia, Grace, Sophie, and Anna Craft. And all the three children, are, I, I love them dearly, and I speak into their lives. I have another do a daughter that lives in New York, and, and uh, she's married to, uh, uh, to Tom. And they have uh, Owen, Noah, and Angelina Hope. And I love those two boys and that beautiful little girl called Anna Craft, uh, 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 Angelina Hope. Why do I... Why do I say this? It's because I speak to them powerfully every single day. Now, I want to show you something. I wonder if uh, my brother can pick up that for me right there. And uh, I want to show you something here. Very. This is our ministry, and this is our here. studio. Yes, right there. Now, I want to show you this. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and Thank you. Thank you, brother. Now, I've been praying for all those people here every single day. I'm praying for my brother Rick and Danielle and Renato and Reinaldo. I'm praying for Rick Jr., Laura, all of the families here. I'm praying for John and Tara, you know. He did a great blessing to us and ministered to us for 12 years. I'm praying for Marcelo, the pastor in Brazil. I'm praying for Betty McKinney. I'm praying for Kathy and all her family, Mike and Tammy and Bill and Brian and Cameron. I'm praying for Felipe. I'm praying for Sil Sil Silvana. I'm praying for Kim Kim and his Stella and the children. I'm praying for Randall Cup. You know, he's going to North. I'm praying for Jason and all his family. I'm praying for, I'm praying for all these people. Now, you probably say, Rick, are you speaking into their lives? Yes, I am. Are you, saying to, are you saying to them that they are welcome in Jesus' name? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm saying to them they're welcome in Jesus' name. Let me ask you this. Prophetically, I speak into their lives. I call into being every dream, every ambition, every, every idea to build their lives, to become a blessing to the nations, all of them, my family, my children, my dear friends. Regardless of my sin, confessed at the foot of the cross, I move now toward my day of reckoning with Christ. And I'll continue to speak healing, deliverance, in spite of all that has happened to me. Why do I say this? It's because my, my, my sin will not separate me from the blessing and the glory of God. And, and, in other words, I'm moving forward. I'm moving towards Jesus. I'm in power. So I speak to Kathy today. That she be blessed by the Lord. I speak to Pastor Marcel in Brazil. He be blessed and full of the Holy Spirit. I speak to, to, to uh, uh, Eliane. 
I speak to the cooks. I speak to the women that cook. I, I speak in the name of Jesus to Felipe. I speak to my brother Daniel, the manager of our mission in Brazil. And I ask that he be blessed abundantly. I speak to you, my brother, that contact us throughout the whole world. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I prophesy the best December, the, all the bills paid, all the glory of God, the best present you're going to get in Jesus' name. Jesus 